Welcome to the 12th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access meeting papers should ensure that they're switched to silent. Uh, before we begin, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank former member Rachel Hamilton for her work um, during her time on the committee. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking item five in private. Are members content to do that? Yes. Uh, our second item of business today is an evidence session on the EU referendum and its implications for Scotland uh, from the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe. Um, welcome, Minister, and his official Ian Mitchell. I'd like to invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here again. Uh, I've obviously given evidence to this committee before. And can I compliment the committee on the series of reports you've produced and the way in which you are building a, a corpus of work, important work that informs the Brexit situation. I'm happy to take the opportunity to update you today on where uh, the Brexit negotiations are following the trigger triggering of Article 50. I was very disappointed, as was the Scottish Government, that Article 50 was triggered without any meaningful consultation, did any consultation at all with the Scottish Government about the content of the letter um, and without proper consideration of the proposals we put forward, the compromise propo proposals in Scotland's place in Europe. And I think the formal response and the pantomime around the formal response, which we've seen in terms of access to information, indicates a lack of serious consideration of what were important and, I think, very workable proposals. Um, nonetheless, we are where we are. Uh, we intend to continue to engage as constructively as we can within the JMC-EN process, although that process will have to return to the intentions that were and are in the terms of reference. We continue to believe that the UK government's Brexit approach, a harder and harder Brexit approach, presents a highly significant threat to jobs and prosperity in Scotland. There is a clear consensus, I believe, in Scotland that leaving the European Union will damage the Scottish economy just as it will damage the UK economy. And there are wider issues I'm happy to refer to today in terms of uh, the rights of EU nationals. And of course, we are all also EU citizens and the way in which our rights will be affected. And I've spent some considerable time in recent weeks talking to uh, EU nationals about the difficulties they find themselves in, and I'm happy to elaborate upon that. And of course, the UK government stance continues to undermine the expressed democratic will of the Scottish electorate. The people of Scotland did not vote for Brexit, uh, and they have the right to reject it and to make a different choice. That's why the First Minister, mandated by the Scottish Parliament to hold a Scottish referendum on independence to be held between the autumn of 2018 and the spring of 2019, once the terms of Brexit are known. That will be the choice between the UK's negotiation of Brexit and a Scottish future as an independent country within Europe. Now, we will do all we can to make sure that Scotland's interests are represented in the process of negotiation. <coughs> and I repeat that publicly. We do not believe that a hard and bad Brexit will be good for Scotland. There has to be a better deal than that, and we'll do everything we can to assist to get it. Uh, we need to reset the JMC process to achieve that. Uh, we also need a great deal more information than is presently forthcoming, and when we come on to matters such as uh, the Great Repeal Bill, I'll indicate to you where I think that is already presenting considerable problems uh, in terms of not sharing with us the information that we know exists. Two weeks ago, this committee heard the views of young people on Brexit. That's one of the groups that will be most affected, and I continue to work with young people and other organisations to make sure that I understand those concerns and can also fold those into the process of negotiation and representation, and I also uh, increase, do increasing work with the widest range of stakeholders so that I understand their position and that they, to, I assist them in articulating their views so that they are heard more widely. And I think all of us welcome the engagement that's taking place from Scotland's Parliament, Scotland's committees, Scottish Government, uh, with the people of Scotland on these issues. And I'll look forward to discussing these and to future engagement plans with the committee today and no doubt in the future. Thank you very much, Mr Russell. In Mr Davis' uh, response uh, to the Scottish Government, uh, he states that it's his belief that the Scottish Government and the UK Government agree on a large majority of, of subjects and 
the, sort of, the impression is that there's very little between you. I wonder if you'd perhaps like to clarify. I think many people will be confused uh, by that statement. Well, uh, um, I have to say, and, and with the greatest respect to, to, to David, he has been saying that for a considerable period of time, as have the, um, has the Prime Minister. I've never believed it was true. And I think if you see in the exchange of letters, um, I make that point yet again to him in my response to his letter of the uh, 29th of March. And indeed, uh, I, his letter of the 29th of March talked about um, the, the issue, I think, of the, uh, the, the majority of subjects that we had discussed we were in agreement with. So I, I took the bother of looking at the agendas for the JMC, the four that have been held, and I could only find two items in which I think there was any measure of agreement at all. Uh, on almost all the others, we uh, reserved our position. We made it clear we didn't agree. Uh, at most of the JMC, in fact, all the JMC substantive items, after discussion, the item was simply taken away for officials to consider and has never re-emerged. So uh, I don't think it is true to say that we agree. And in fact, you can see that on the largest issues. You know, we do not agree on the importance of membership of the single market. And it's not enough to say, well, you know, the UK government doesn't want to be members of the single market, but actually we want everything that the single market provides, but none of the conditions of being in the single market. That's not an agreement. Uh, that, that is, you know, I can agree, no doubt, with the UK government on the need for world peace. I think we would find our approach would be very different. On that point, um, it, I, the Prime Minister made a statement recently in Downing Street about uh, the... Uh, process of the negotiations. Uh, I wondered if you would care to comment on wh how you think that will affect uh, the negotiations in the coming uh, weeks. Months. I think it was extremely foolish. Uh, I said to her at the time, I said to the First Minister, and I'm happy to put that on the record again, uh, it, to take these very sensitive negotiations, to try and use them for the essentially to stoke up uh, a, 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 an election issue that creates resentment towards the EU is an incredibly foolish thing to do and will have produced and has produced a resentment within the 27. If the UK negotiating tactic is, as it often appears to be, to divide and rule, to find weaknesses with, between the unanimity of the 27 and to probe into those, it would seem, it just on a basic negotiating premise, foolish to do something that would solidify the feelings of the 27. But that is precisely what she did. But I just think it's also the language is utterly wrong. Uh, there needs to be a sensible process of negotiation. Uh, and there's a sort of parallel in this. You know, we have tried since the establishment of the JMC, indeed, we've, we've tried since the JMC plenary last September, and indeed the First Minister m m earlier than that in the discussion she had with Theresa May very early on, to establish a way forward which would allow us to have meaningful negotiations within these islands. And we have constantly been stymied by the approach of the Prime Minister. And it does seem that having undertaken that as a sort of template, she's now to trying to do it in the wider EU negotiations. It's foolish. Have you been given any indication in terms of your discussions as to who is likely to be conducting the negotiations because the Prime Minister has given the impression that she will be conducting the negotiations but the EU has ruled out heads of state conducting the negotiations well, and I wondered if you had heard anything that would enlighten... Heads of government. Heads of government you know, will clearly be very influential. My experience of this process is the Prime Minister tries to decide everything. So I can't imagine the negotiations moving forward without her very substantial influence. Uh, but in terms of negotiation, a great deal of work will be done by the Sherpas. It will be done by those who are essentially repre officials representing the ministers. And a great deal of it will be done before ministers get anywhere near each other. But we don't know the formal structure of it, and you know, we don't know our own place in it. Uh, there has been an attempt at each JMC, I think, perhaps not the first one, but there's an attempt at each JMC to find out what the intentions of the UK government were about the involvement of the devolved administrations in whatever negotiating structure would be established. Uh, we know no more about this. The, the position of the Welsh government has been that the devolved administration should be at the table when devolved issues are discussed and in the room when all other matters are discussed. Uh, we've not expressed it in that way, but I, I support that view. Certainly, we need to have a substantive involvement in the process. We do not know anything about that. Now, the reasoning that we've been given for that is that the UK government themselves did not know how that process would work. That may well be true. 
But you know, they have far more idea about that than we have, and still we have no indication at all. So, so what is the Scottish Government's position on the, the EU negotiating position? We already know what the red, red lines are. Does the Scottish Government have a position on those red lines? Uh, we are and will bring forward our views on each of the issues as they arise. You know, we will bring forward our thinking on the issue of the deficit. Clearly, we do not believe that Scotland should be paying any share of the, uh, uh, sorry, the, 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 con the money, the debt owed. We don't believe that Scotland should be paying any share of that money. We didn't vote for this. And certainly, there should be no detriment to the Scottish budget and the economy as a result of this decision. Um, and we will bring forward our views on all these issues. Many of them we've expressed a view up until now. I'm now quite keen to bring those views together and to make them widely available. I agree with the EU approach on transparency, and we'll put our views up uh, quite transparen transparently and let people see them. But I gave a, a lecture in, in University College Cork uh, about three weeks ago, um, a lecture, the annual lecture for the uh, Irish uh, Contemporary European Studies Institute, and I talked there about our great strong support for work being done both by the UK government and by the Irish government to ensure that the border issue was settled constructively. Uh, and you know, so we, we've taken positions on that. We've taken a position on the EU nationals and the need for uh, a, a, what should have been immediate uh, recognition of their right to remain. And uh, that should have been cleared off, frankly, 11 months ago. Finally, on uh, the Scottish Government's position, you obviously had Scotland's uh, uh, position in Europe paper uh, uh, published last year, and that has now uh, been dismissed by the UK Government. So going into these new future negotiations, what does the Scottish Government hope to uh, get out of it? I mean, is it still your position that you want a differentiated solution? Well, I, you know, we would, if that were to re-emerge as an issue, of course it would be our position, but I don't think it will re-emerge as an issue. The, there was a very strong attempt by ourselves, actually, and by the Welsh, to ensure that Wales and Scotland were referred to in the Article 50 letter as uh, areas where there should be a differentiated approach, just as Northern Ireland was referred to, and there appears to be a forgetfulness about m mentioning Gibraltar in the letter uh, in that regard, which we might have been able to help with, uh, you know, had we been consulted on the letter. Um, so that was a key issue, and our view was, had that been in the Article 50 letter, it would have been placed on the table and therefore would have been part of the negotiating process. And we believe that that was a perfectly feasible thing to happen. Well, we, we now, uh, you know, we are where we are on this. A lot of the work in Scotland's Place of Europe is still very valuable. You know, it is, would not be impossible for the Prime Minister, for example, to look at the devolved issues again and to say that that, that makes a great deal of sense. But we've laid out what we now believe should happen. There should, the process of negotiation will continue. We'll support that. We'll try and assist the UK in getting the best possible deal. Uh, but it is then the right thing for the people of Scotland to be able to choose, to be able to choose whatever the outcome is and independence uh, and the position of Scotland as an independent member of the EU. That's, that's the right choice for the people of Scotland to make. And we'll ensure that they're able to make it, which is, of course, the view of the Scottish Parliament, because the Scottish Parliament has voted in the majority for that view. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. And Minister, you've already referred to the election. I'm sure you will recognise that the democratic choice of the British people to make a different choice of government and a different choice of strategy in re relation to Brexit is, is, is important to uh, acknowledge at the beginning of, of, of this session. And so I would want to distinguish between the relationship of the Scottish Government with a future UK Government and what we've seen uh, in recent months in the relationship with the outgoing Conservative government. Uh, and, and particularly, I would like to start with the uh, exchange of letters, which uh, I know you released a few days ago now. David Mundell wrote to this committee on the 3rd of April and referred to a letter that you had received from David Davis that, uh, on the 29th of March. I wonder um, if you would uh, outline why it took from the 3rd of April until the 20. Uh, uh, 7th of April for either government to release that document and the circumstances around I, I'd be very happy to do so and, and before I do so can I simply acknowledge the, you know, the absolute correctness of the point you make in terms of choice of government there is an election pending we cannot second guess the outcome of that election uh, you know, but quite clearly our view is that Scotland should be within the EU and that is uh, uh, it, it, where we are yes it, it's an interesting uh, set of issues we were asked uh, by your clerk for these letters. 
And we replied, the Scottish Government replied to your clerk saying that in the provisions of the Memorandum of Understanding between the UK Government and devolved administrations, we couldn't supply a copy since the UK Government were considered the owner of the letter under the Memorandum of Understanding and we, it wasn't released into the public domain. In other words, we had no objection. But there is an MOU. The MOU says, you know, if you're the owner of the letter, you get to say it. So quite rightly, we said, go and ask the, the UK. What we didn't expect was that the Department of Exit in the UK said that they really didn't want to release it. You know, so it was their decision, uh, and they didn't want to release it. And there it would have probably uh, stayed. I mean, I was perfectly happy for my response to be published, um, uh, in no difficulty at all. Had uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland then said in the House of Commons on the 19th of April, and I quote him on this, Scotland's place in Europe did play an important part in the government's thinking. Just so the hecklers opposite are clear, the government has formally responded to the Scottish government in relation to Scotland's place in Europe, and surprisingly, the Scottish government asked us not to publish our response. That is untrue. There was no such request. And in those circumstances, my view was absolutely clearly that both letters should then be published. So I may have breached the memorandum of understanding, but I've done so because that statement is untrue. You now have the letters in front of you. You can see what the, the exchange was about, and you can see the difference of opinion. Now, you know, they're perfectly polite letters. I also, in context, saw David Davis on the Monday of that week. I think that's the 27th in Glasgow when the Prime Minister saw uh, the First Minister, David came to Glasgow as well and I had a meeting with him. I spoke to him on the phone, I think on the evening of the 29th, and I, I had seen the letter about an, half an hour before, and I, during that phone call I said to him, look, you know, I disagree with this letter and I particularly disagree with your assertion that we've agreed on lots of things. I think his response was, yes, I thought you would. Uh, you know, and it was a perfectly amicable discussion and then I responded to him some time later. That was also the recess week, so it took a little bit of time to, to get that response, and I responded to them. And you have that in front of them. Now, you know, I've had conversations with him regularly. I won't go into the detail of all of them. Uh, I've had private meetings, bilateral meetings, and I've had phone conversations. So there has been a debate and discussion. And I'm not averse to letters being published. Um, I think we've, we're all in the glare of publicity. I just think that perhaps the Secretary of State for Scotland should have... Uh, stuck to the actual facts. Thank you very much. I, I'm grateful for the full uh, outline on that, and I understand the basis for on which you made the judgment, uh, as you say, to breach the memorandum of understanding in order to put those letters in the public domain, and, and, and it's absolutely right. They should be in the public domain, and mysterious as to why uh, the UK government was reluctant to do that. I wonder if you can tell us, are there any implications from uh, the decision you made uh, to breach um, that memorandum. Uh, nobody's, nobody's yet told me I shouldn't have done it, but you know, I may receive that information at the next uh, JMC. I should point out we don't have a date for a future JMC. We've had four JMC ENs uh, in November, December, January and February. The last was on the 8th of February. Um, I've had a meeting with David, I've had two meetings with David Davis since then. I've had a number of phone calls. But the commitment to monthly JMC ENs was breached. There wasn't one in March. Um, I think that was because you know, it would have been increasingly difficult in the March meeting to say to the members, you can't see the draft Article 50 letter, because uh, it must have existed by then. Um, but uh, there was none in March. Uh, it, there, were, was none in, there have been none in April. Uh, there are, clearly won't be any in May. Uh, I suppose it's technically possible one could be squeezed in by the end of June. But given everything that's happening, the Queen's speech will be on the 19th of June. Uh, I, I've made it clear I am available you know, to attend the JMC by negotiation on any uh, reasonable occasion. I suspect we may stretch into early July, uh, at the earliest one. So that will have been, in that period of time, only four of those meetings. And that's, that also breaches a commitment that was entered into. The European Commission's uh, consideration of these matters suggests that once negotiations begin, they'll operate in a four-weekly cycle. Uh, and uh, you, will, you will know the detail of, of yeah. what they have said. What proposals will you put to the incoming UK government in terms of the relationship between that cycle and meetings of JMC? -EM? Well, clearly, the terms of reference of the JMC, and it's a very good question, the terms of reference of the JMC refer to the oversight you know, of, of the negotiations insofar as devolved competences are concerned. So clearly, they would have to fit in with that. Now, the precedent, I suppose, is in the JMCE which was always meant to meet in advance of the European Council, so that the agenda for the European Council could be discussed 
uh, between the devolved administrations and the UK departments. It got a very top-heavy uh, structure, it developed a very top-heavy structure because actually it was a means by which all the Whitehall departments, ministers in the Whitehall departments could find out about the European Council. So I once went to a JMCE in which I think there were 21 UK ministers, myself and Rodri Morgan. So, you know, it, it didn't really work as it should have done. But that would indicate, I suspect, that the agenda for the negotiations uh, each month should be discussed by the JMCEN in the first week of the cycle, I would think, or, uh, and then uh, the committee would have to probably come back at its next meeting, would have to review that pro progress and look forward. That would seem to be ideal. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. And I, finally, just to relate that to, because I think that process is going to be critical over mm -hmm. the months ahead, to relate that to the relationship between yourself as the Minister and this committee and between the Government mm -hmm. and Parliament. Uh, in your reply of the 4th of May in re reference to our report on determining Scotland's future relationship with the EU, you said much that, 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 that I would welcome, but, but, but perhaps the one thing I was uh, most disappointed at was your view that there was no need to expand on the written agreement between the Government and the Parliament on informing uh, Parliament of the process. Now, the example we've just mm -hmm. considered shows the, the, well, the, the be... room there is for, for things of great importance mm -hmm. to be withheld from Parliament, not necessarily by your choice, but nonetheless <coughs> under the circumstances that currently apply. And I wonder, therefore, whether uh, mm. you would reconsider that uh, uh, bold statement that there's no need for any difference in approach well, to... Only because uh, the existing structure can cope perfectly well with what I've just talked about in terms of how it would work. You know, you, the committee would expect to be informed of what has taken place in each of those cycles. It will also be supplemented by the publication of information, just as the EU is committed to the publication of information um, as the process continues and the issue of transparency. As I've indicated earlier on, so are we. So we will publish information as we move forward um, so, uh, and you know, make it available. So I don't think it's a question of withholding anything. I just think the structures we have, supplemented by the transparency we are committed to, would, would create a, a substantial and proper flow of information from ourselves to the committee. I mean, I'm absolutely committed to transparency in this process. There will clearly be things which you, we will want to negotiate privately for a while, but actually, the vast majority of things, we want people to know what our position is. And we think that the EU position is right on this. I've had conversations with a range of European parliamentarians who are also of that view and, of course, who will be keen observers because the role of the European Parliament at the end of this process is absolutely crucial. So this is, this is about keeping the, all the democratic forces informed, and this is one of the democratic forces. I, I, I... I accept and support much of, much of that. I, I guess part of the, my sense of the problems in recent months have, has been how much we have learned after the event when it's uh, too late for uh, any influence to be brought to bear. You may feel the same. Well, I um, feel the I, same way, actually. I, I, I wonder, though, in terms of what the Scottish Government has taken to the table at JMCEN, right. how far you think it would be useful to let us know hmm? what you are putting to UK yeah. Government colleagues as the vital interests of Scotland in those negotiations? It's quite important to, to recognise, I think, that you know, in an ideal world, you know, we would be in a position to know more before the JMCs than we have been. You know, I, much has been made previously of a JMC in which we didn't even know the room we were going to be in, let alone you know, what was really on the agenda. We've been seeing agendas a day before, day or two, two days before maximum. You know, so uh, you know, we've not been in a position. One of the reasons I've only been accompanied by one other minister to, uh, to the four, which was Michael Matheson, he came with me to the, the second one, was because we did know that justice and home affairs was to be a, an issue then, and we'd agreed that well in advance, but 10 days in advance, perhaps a week in advance. Most of the time we haven't known what's been happening. The, the standing items have been an update from the chair, but even David Davis, I think, has only been to two of those meetings throughout the meeting. I think the other two he's popped in because he's been in House of Commons debates. So, you know, it's not been a stable process. I noticed that Mark Drakeford, my Welsh counterpart, compared uh, the arrangements unfavourably to a community council within his constituency. I think he was being quite generous. Thank you very much. Just as a, a quick supplementary on that, you, uh, Minister, you, you had mentioned that uh, one of the JMCEN meetings was cancelled, in your view, because uh, the UK government didn't want to discuss 
the Article uh, 50 notification letter. Uh, was there any consultation at all on the Article 50 notification letter? No, it was a considerable matter of discussion from a very early stage. Um, I would have to, I mean, minutes have only appeared recently. I think uh, minutes only appeared at the end of March for the two previous meetings. I, I, we had difficulty in getting minutes, but I would have to check. But I think on every meeting there has been reference to the Article 50 letter. It certainly occurred in all my discussions with David Davis, I would say, pretty all, much all. It was a major subject of discussion at the JMC plenary in end of January in Cardiff. Uh, and the request was very simple, that we should be consulted upon the terms of the letter in whole or in part. Uh, the argument was there was no letter. The argument was then no decision had been made whether the letter was two sentences or 20 pages. That became quite an issue for a period of time. The length of the letter became quite an issue. Um, and then uh, there was then no response to what was pretty much a formal request I made face to face uh, in February uh, uh, for uh, involvement in the process. And then nothing happened during March. Um, and then we saw that the, the, the letter came, of course, the day before the white paper. There was a commitment, I think, the week before that we would see the white paper two days in advance. We didn't, we, but we did see it a day in advance, um, which was much better than we'd had in the previous um, white paper. That was a great repeal bill white paper. The previous white paper we were promised the day before and never got it until 40 minutes before it was published. In terms of the Article 50 letter, I've said this publicly before, but I just put it back on the record. I saw the Article 50 letter about half an hour after the Prime Minister had got up in the House of Commons. Okay. I didn't see it in draft or in any other text before then. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jackson Carlo. Good morning. Morning. Um, actually, Lewis MacDonald's covered a lot of the ground I'd like to with a general election underway. Of course, the stuff of politics flies freely in, in, in discussion and comment. Um, so, I would like to just go back to a remark you made, which is we are where we are, that kind of popular expression about what the government now does. Um, a lot of your energy, uh, rightly, was in preparing the Scottish government's contribution to the discussion that was to take place. Um, and whatever one thinks of the response, we've now got the response and we move forward from there. And so I'm interested to know, from a structural point of view, um, how you are now approaching the next phase in terms of uh, the Scottish Government, the uh, civil service, the work streams that you are now preparing, the resource that you feel you have and are bringing to those preparations in advance of whatever the next phase proves to be. And I think it would be interesting, given the scrutiny we'll have to apply as time goes on, to have, just have a better understanding of, uh, and I understand from what you've said that you're still not clear what the JMC contributory uh, process will be, but what you are now preparing to do and the, the resource and structure you're putting in place to do that? Yeah, um, it's a very good question. I'm happy to, to answer it. Let me deal with three separate issues. Uh, there is the issue of what our position is. And you're right to say this was a substantive piece of work. We intend to continue with substantive work on the issues that will arise during the negotiation and the desired outcome from those issues. Scotland will have to have a desired outcome from all the issues. What, what do we actually need to get out of this situation? Um, and, you know, that, that in some cases may be the same as what the UK wishes to get out of it, that we, perhaps we would go about it in a different way. But so we, we are working on those things. And my job in that regard will be to coordinate the work across the government of... Uh, all the directorates and all the cabinet secretaries and to build that into a coherent whole so that we can both answer the position of what is the Scottish Government's position on this and what do we wish to see happen uh, and what, what is good for us, which is the right position to, to hold, and how we can ensure that that is part of the UK negotiating procedure. The first part of that is much easier than the second. So there is a process issue of how you influence the UK government. You know, we've discussed that and can discuss that again. But we will be clear about what we want um, and we will also be you know, in the process, when we know that, of building and developing the structures to deliver that were we able to do so. An example, of course, would be in, in agriculture, where we would have to have our preferred position. Uh, we would have to have the ability to deliver that preferred position. And we need to know that that preferred position would work for the, the stakeholders. So it's, it's a complex process in which we're involving lots and lots of people. Uh, I've been debating the future structure of 
agriculture with a constituent of mine in Iona, Andrew Prentice, by Twitter this morning. Uh, you know, and he has views about what will work for remote islands in terms of agricultural support. So that type of thing needs to be folded into. So there's the issue of preparing our position on negotiations in the, in the round, knowing the detail and when issues will be up, knowing the process that will be followed. For example, the first issues we need to have be clear about our preferred position. I've indicated them. The, the, the debt is, is one, the, the cost of leaving, um, you know, our position on the, the, the Irish border, our position on EU nationals, our position on another issue that will arise in that first round, which is the role of the ECJ and has ECJ's, uh, what role it has in the whole process. Our position then on all the devolved issues that will be affected, uh, the position on the frameworks on agriculture and fisheries, for example, you know, the desire, the terms of the, the letters and the Prime Minister's message have been slightly different. Prime Minister talking about UK frameworks returning to the, to the EU frameworks returning to the UK and then decisions about where they are. David Davis referring to uh, a consensus about new frameworks. So there's an issue to find out precisely what that means. We oppose the issue of EU frameworks coming back to UK in that way. They should, all competencies should be devolved directly. Uh, that is a Welsh position too. It is, I think, substantially the Northern Irish position were there to be one at this stage. Um, and we would want to work very hard to make sure that happens. So that's issue one. Issue two is the Great Repeal Bill. That's tremendously complex, the biggest legislative task that we will, any of us will ever take on. We do not, we have not seen the draft. The draft exists, it was meant to be published. The Queen's Speech round about now is obviously off for a month. It would be enormously helpful. And I you know, say that very clearly. It would be enormously helpful if civil servants were sharing that with their counterparts here. It would give us an opportunity to prepare uh, because you know, whatever happens, unless you know, another government decides not to leave the um, uh, EU, we're going to have to go through that process. The better, we need a good start on it. We've only seen the white paper. The white paper is huge. You know, dubieties in it and issues we don't fully understand. We need to see that. Then we need to work out, and it can't be an ex cathedral pronouncement from London, we need to know about the legislative consent and other processes. It's inconceivable to me that there, cannot, there should not be legislative consent given where we are, given that we that will cover areas we legislate in, which is precisely what, therefore, we have to have legislative consent process. That's not clear. Uh, the UK government has not said whether that's the case or not. Big burden of secondary legislation and other legislation, because the Great Repeal Bill is only the first of several, maybe 10, 12 bills. So how that works in, where our resource allocation is there, you're right, that's a lot of work being done on that resource allocation. And getting that through, and this committee, I suspect, will, when it confronts the issue of Great Repeal Bill, will be concerned about the workload on this committee. There are issues for the Parliament in there too. And then there is the third and wider issue of influence and, and making sure our position is understood. And you know, that is something that we continue to do. My colleague Fiona Hislop is very active in it. Uh, I'm involved in certain places, making sure that people understand what our position is. Uh, and, you know, that is something we will have to continue to do. Too. So there's no shortage of work being done and preparation. <laughs> On the, the first of, of, of those points, Minister, I mean, once the negotiations are underway, uh, all of us have a, a vested interest in the best possible outcome for Scotland from those. Uh, we may at times disagree as to what that might be, but there may be times when the Scottish Parliament and the parties within it do agree on what the approach should be. And I wonder just how you intend to seek to identify and potentially ensure that the positions that are represented um, enjoy the widest possible support as and when that proves to be possible for you so to do. I mean, how do you well, imagine... I, I... I think in the sense you're feeding into a negotiation, which mm -hmm. can sometimes be quite tricky and operate on all different levels, um, that that influence is maximised in every possible way. Well, I mean, this committee would have a role, and, and if that is an invitation for me to bring more European and EU debates to the Parliament, something that I think you and your colleagues were complaining about at some stage, but if it's an invitation to do so, I'm very happy to make sure these matters are debated on the, uh, in, the, in the parliamentary chamber. I think there will be issues that we will wish to develop support for. I mean, I, I think the question of, of agricultural structures is a key one. And we will have to you know, make sure that people are interested and are, are bringing their points of view. Fergus Ewing you know, will be key to that. He will want to make sure that he is reaching out through relevant committees. 
and making sure that there is support and there is discussion. And you know, th this parliament has a big role in influencing those things too. There is no monopoly of wisdom on positions being taken and there will be views from people who have strong, uh, strong views on issues which we will want to hear. So I, I mean, it's a parliamentary process. I'm quite keen to see it as a parliamentary process and providing uh, members uh, do not become bored uh, ish, uh, debating uh, Brexit issues, I'm always up for it. Uh, well, of course, there is a distinction between debating uh, highly speculatively and debating the substantive issues as they actually are progressing through. You, you mentioned the Great Repeal Bill, and no doubt you will have had conversations, the Scottish Government, with uh, other uh, governments in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and I think we all appreciate the potential uh, workload that could arise for the devolved administrations as a consequence. And that is something for the Parliament to give consideration to as well. But from the government's point of view, um, how do you anticipate reconciling that with what the government's uh, work programme might have otherwise have been uh, and how you manage, you imagine those two things will operate in tandem? Well, that will be an issue for the UK government as well as for ourselves. I mean, you know, the, the workload at Westminster on these bills will be enormous. Uh, they have greater resources and larger number of members. You know, our, uh, our workload will be very large too. Uh, we will have to manage it, so we'll have to find a way to do it because we cannot afford on the 29th of March 2019 to find that there are substantive areas of law that are inoperable. Uh, so it will have to be done. The question of how it is done and how rapidly it can be done is taxing all of us. Um, you know, there is this issue of what is called south of the border Henry VIII powers, but essentially is, is fast-tracking without parliamentary process or due parliamentary process, whole swathes of secondary legislation. That will certainly be something they will need to do at Westminster. We do not know whether you know, we will be able to do that or whether we would want to do that, some, some things that may be necessary. Our position, you know, our position will be perhaps in terms of requirement resource more difficult than they have imagined south of the border because it's not just 8.8% of all legislation. We deal with some very substantive areas of European legislation, which the changes to which will be as complex as they are in south of the border. And we also have our own legal system. And that, you know, I've had uh, discussions with uh, the Law Society, with the Faculty of Advocates. I've been involved in uh, round table meetings with, with Michael Matheson and, and various stakeholders. And we are very, very aware of those problems and also the problems that will be presented by not having certain types of European uh, legislation available to us. You know, there are issues you will know from your justice work, for example, in the... Um, uh, in the uh, European arrest warrants, uh, in some of the family law issues, there are complex but very effective systems in place. If we are no longer part of those and if we revert to systems before they came in, we will not have operability across Europe. You know, we will be dealing essentially with, with archaic systems, which are, and there are other systems operated across the 27. Those are very big questions which will need to be resolved even before we undertake the legislative process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ross Greer. Thank you. Um, Minister, you actually uh, covered substantially some of what I was going to ask in regard to the, the Henry VIII powers, um, but just very briefly on the back of that, recognising what you've just said about uh, as yet being unsure if they're uh, wanted or required in Scotland, what process would you envisage for the Scottish Government making that decision? Because obviously it is a substantive decision to, to make to use those powers which some would say circumnavigate parliamentary scrutiny? We haven't seen the UK proposals for those because we haven't seen the detail of how they intend them to operate. So until I see that, and this is an issue of seeing the actual repeal bill, I mean, it's, in, it's there in draft form. I wish I was able to say, having seen it, you know, our officials having seen it, this is how it will operate there. Can we then, should we then, duplicate those powers assuming the bill will give them to us or will we find another route? Uh, my instinct you know, is always against uh, using powers that do not have adequate scrutiny. That is the wrong thing to do. The imperative is to have this work done, you know, so that there is no collapse in systems. I mean, if you look at some organisation, I had a very interesting meeting yesterday, I'm sure they won't mind me saying so, with the Scottish Food Standards Body. I think they'd identified less than 3% of their work that isn't covered by European regulation. 
you know, and legislation. So unless we get that done you know, in less than two years, then there's going to be a huge issue in terms of food safety so, um, and, and food production and food export. Um, so we will have to do it. So the question is, once we see the powers, we have to ask ourselves if it is possible to operate without them. If it isn't possible to operate without them, then we will have to ensure that there is the widest possible support for us to operate with them. And I think that will require discussions right across the Parliament. Thank you. Um, and on the potential outcomes of negotiations, there have been a considerable amount of speculation about potential outcomes, a um, considerable amount of evidence given by substantial figures. Uh, Professor Sir David Edwards said to us that it's a way with the fairies, the idea that you could sort all this out in two years. Uh, Lord Kerr, former UK ambassador to the EU, I think he said there was just under a 50% chance, in his opinion, that negotiations would fail. Um, what scenario planning is the Scottish Government doing for these kind of worst case scenarios of failed negotiations or negotiations being resolved for our exit, but perhaps no transitional arrangements made before the future trading relationship? Very fortuitously, you know, the First Minister appointed a council of experts that includes John Kerr and David Edwards, amongst others. So there's a very distinguished group of people who are being very uh, thoughtful about this. Um, I think the chances of the UK not sticking with the negotiations are high. I don't think they're necessarily you know, 50% or 60%, but they're high. Um, and therefore, we, it is in our mind that we would have to be prepared in those circumstances. Um, all I can say is we have a range of scenarios which we look at regularly. You start probably with that issue and you work your way through hard Brexit with detriment to devolution, hard Brexit without detriment to devolution, you know, a, a moderate uh, Brexit which, in which devolved powers are increased uh, through to independence, of course, which we believe is the offering that should be made. Uh, so we look at all of those and we have thought through some of the issues. But if there's going to be a collapse in negotiations, it will probably happen sooner rather than later. You know, I mean, I think that the real pressure points will be uh, the, the debt. You know, um, uh, that would be the biggest of the pressure points, I would have thought. If they can get through then to the autumn, I think the prospects of the negotiations going full term become better. Uh, but you know, then you go into the European Parliament ratification and a process also of ratification which will involve, now it looks as if, will involve most of the parliaments of Europe. Um, so it's a complex process. Things could fail. Um, and the European Parliament has been known to take an individualistic view and you know, it has set some red lines. It set them early on and it would be foolish for those to be ignored. So we, we think about it. I spend quite a lot of my time thinking about things I'd rather not think about. Thank you. And I, I realise this is, like most of this discussion, highly speculative, but in the event of these scenarios beginning to play out, at what point would you believe it appropriate for the government to present its uh, proposals to Parliament? Specifically proposals on... And, uh, if we were in the situation of it looking likely that the negotiations would fail, um, my point would be it would be preferable for Parliament to be presented with the Scottish Government's plan for this before it yes. happens. Well, uh, we would want to make sure that the Parliament was not only fully consulted, but we had a proposal for the Parliament to consider at the earliest possible stage. I mean, one of the hallmarks that the First Minister has brought to this, and I think it's very important to say this, has been always to have thought through what the next steps are. You know, the day after... The, the referendum, she was out there saying we need to do this, this and this. You know, she is, I think, absolutely determined that we should be clear in our thinking about all these matters, so we will, we will have a plan. Uh, I, I, I'm sure of that. Thank you. And Richard Lockhead, do you have a supplementary? <coughs> yes, Ross Gears, uh, theme of questioning. Uh, maybe I can just follow up with the Minister. The increasing number of references from the UK Prime Minister to the idea of no deal is better than a bad deal uh, am I imagining that, or is it the case that the Prime Minister is saying that more and more? And what signals do you think that's sending out to the Scottish Government? Well, I mean, I think she is, and I think that you know, some people would speculate that she's saying that in order to strengthen her hand in the negotiations, to make the rest of the, uh, the, the twen to make the 27 fearful of that, and therefore determined to you know, give ground. Um, others think that there isn't much system in what she says about the EU, that she's operating on a political basis, not on thinking rationally through the negotiating process. Um, 
There shouldn't be any dubiety that no deal is considerably worse than any other option. Uh, you know, that is, that is a really, really bad option. There should also be no dubiety about the naivety with which many people think the UK government has entered into this process without a full understanding of what the complexities are from the European perspective. It's quite important to read as widely as you can on some of the European views of this. It's a very, very different view that is taken. Uh, and with some astonishment that you know, things are where they are. I mean, your own, uh, you know, your own clerks produce uh, you know, for you a publication, uh, the, the latest one of which has two articles specifically on this issue, uh, the, the way in which this looks from elsewhere. And you know, I've spent time in Brussels, as do some of my colleagues, and you know, what you hear there is a very, obviously a very different view. Now, you know, the UK government would say, well, that's just you know, the EU's view. But actually, the 27 are a bit mystified by where this has gone, uh, and a bit troubled, but it's not the only thing on their agenda. So they don't feel themselves to be, uh, you know, hectored and pressured in the way that perhaps she thinks they would feel themselves to be. There are bigger issues sometimes for the other 27, and they're addressing them in that way. Um, I hope that there is a process that produces an outcome which is successful. I actually think, not unlike one of the pieces in your own uh, paper, your own summary, um, I actually think in 20 years' time, if the, EU, if the UK does come out, in 20 years' time, the UK will be in the process of trying to be back in, and it will have lost 20 years of influence and 20 years of progress and 20 years of prosperity. Uh, I think it is that foolish. Um, Joe McMillan, can I just say, I understand that the Minister has to be away for 11 o'clock. Yes, I'm, I'm, rather, o'clock, o'clock, I'm, <laughs> I am comfortable, I, 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 you know, I, I'm obviously at his disposal, not all day, no. but you know, uh, and you wouldn't want me here all day, but uh, you know, I'm happy to be flexible. Right, okay, okay. thanks very much, uh, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, good morning, Minister. Good morning. Uh, Minister, has the Scottish Government actually requested a, an official role in the negotiations uh, to order, in order to represent uh, Scottish interests? Well, yes, I mean, you know, the discussions that we've had have been discussions in which we've said uh, we want to have a role, but that role is already guaranteed in a sense. You know, uh, the, the, the terms of reference for the JMCEN, which my, Ian has kindly uh, passed to me, uh, and it's important that I quote them, you know, uh, the uh, item three in those terms of reference says, provide oversight of negotiations with the EU to ensure as far as possible that outcomes agreed by all four governments are secured from these negotiations. And item four, discuss issues stemming from the negotiation process with impact on or of consequence of the UK government. So there is already a definition of what the JM, the role that the JMC would give to the devolved administrations. The exercising of that, uh, certainly in my view, in the view of, of Mark Craig from my colleague, I've heard this view expressed by Sinn Féin ministers as well, and indeed I, I think I've heard this view expressed by DUP ministers, is that there should be an active involvement you know, and it wouldn't be unusual for officials to be involved in complex discussions with Europe uh, as part of UK teams. That does happen. You know, it happens in a variety of areas. So it wouldn't be there would there would be precedent for ensuring that there was representation. As are, you know, ministers do attend a European Council. I mean, I've been to European Council in in three different roles. You know, as Environment Minister, representing on one occasion Agriculture and Fisheries, no less a person than Richard Lockhead. Um, uh, when I think he was off on paternity leave, if I'm correct about that. Um, I've been attended Culture Council when I was Culture Minister, and indeed I, um, I spoke Gaelic at, at, for the first time in the, in, the Scottish, in the European Council. I was the first person to speak Gaelic in a speech, and that was the Culture Council. And I've been to education. I think on rare occasion I've been uh, involved. So there is precedent for involvement. There's even precedent for speaking. Uh, you know, and I, I think that, that is also an issue that needs to be discussed. So I think it would be obvious where we should be. I think the, the issue for debate might be not whether we're there. The issue is what we're there for. You know, are we there simply at the t discussing devolved competencies, or should we be there more widely? And the example I might use for that is freedom of movement. You know, freedom of movement is fundamental to the health of the Scottish economy and indeed to how we see ourselves. And increasingly, people are recognising that. Uh, we should be in there just when the issues of migration and freedom of movement are discussed because they're crucially important to us. 
I think your, clar your clarification there is uh, very helpful, but uh, it's certainly uh, the reason I posed the question. There was a number of reasons, but certainly one of them was it follows on from uh, Jackson Carlow's questions earlier when obviously Mr Carlow was asking you uh, in order to, uh, what would you do to, to actually represent and highlight the, the various interests. I promise Scotland that sometimes also the parties in the Parliament actually can agree on particular issues. So uh, certainly if the Scottish Government actually didn't have uh, an official role in the negotiations, then it would be difficult certainly for the Scottish Government to then actually put forward uh, any particular interest from Scotland. Well, uh, 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 with respect, it wouldn't be difficult for us to put it forward. We intend to be heard. You know, I mean, we're not going to be silent during this process. We'll be constructive, we'll be positive, but we won't be silent. It would be better if there was an effect to us being heard, which was we were able to take this into discussion and through discussion within the JMC, say, or within the negotiating structure, to be able to seek positions uh, you know, which are advantageous to Scotland. So that's what we would seek to do. But there's no question of us not doing or saying things. We, we will be doing that. Okay. Uh, a second area I want to uh, question you on is regarding the, the European Commission's uh, proposed framework. Uh, and, and the four weekly cycle. Now, it's, uh, I just, I'll, I'll read out just a couple of things just in, to get it on the record in terms of what the four weekly cycle actually is. Week one is a week dedicated to internal preparations and consultations. Uh, week, week two is a week for exchange of views between the two sides. Three, a week for negotiation. And four, a week uh, for reporting back, uh, probably to the European Parliament Brexit Group and uh, the Council Working Party, as well as publishing information uh, emerging from the tasks. Now, in terms of the issue of, uh, of the Scottish Government uh, actually reporting uh, back to the Scottish Parliament and also to this committee, uh, and also on the issue of transparency, how, do you, uh, how can you reconcile um, that particular four-weekly cycle uh, and also what you can do to make sure that uh, the Parliament in Scotland is actually informed? We, yeah, we would obviously, as indicated to Lewis MacDonald, at the start of the process, we need to be involved in discussing the position that's taking. At the end of the process, we'd want to represent what the outcomes are in exactly the same way as the EU will represent those outcomes. We don't know whether the UK government will represent those outcomes, but certainly the same way. So I think it fits pretty well in. Um, uh, you know, it's not a, a matter we can influence, frankly, so we'll fit in with it and make sure that we're doing it as, as, as constructively and democratically as possible. I don't say difficulty. Okay. It will be, you know, there's a pressure in that, um, and therefore you have to respond to that pressure. There will be a pressure in showing, for example, if this committee were a committee that would regard itself as wanting to comment upon it, it would have to structure itself to allow itself to do so. Uh, I, but I don't think it's a difficulty in it. Would you anticipate um, uh, regular updates and briefings to, uh, to the committee and also to the chamber? Um, yes, I mean, I've indicated to Lewis MacDonald, I think, you know, that the structures we've got are good and I'm happy to be along and we'll go along with them and we'll supplement them, uh, you with the publication of information. I'm always happy to come to the chamber. There's a number of opportunities in the chamber. One is ministerial statements and updates, which we've done. Another one is um, debates, which I'm, I now understand Jackson Carlow is keen on, so I'd be keen to have more debates, if at all possible. Uh, and, of course, there's a regular questioning. You know, every member can submit written and oral questions and ministers will respond to those. So, lots of possibilities. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Evans. Thank you. Yeah, I was hoping we wouldn't stick to the strict 10 o'clock deadline. There was just a few areas that I was hoping to touch on. Uh, you mentioned a bit about the potential divorce bill, what that might cost. And we heard about the, the House of Lords EU Financial Affairs Committee report on that and their opinion that if we left with no deal, then that would mean that there might not, the UK may not be legally obligated to, to pay anything towards the EU. It was just to get your, your sense of that and yeah, what discussions have been held around that, if any. Well, no discussions around that in the sense that, you know, every, the issue of the bill has been studiously avoided by the UK government, particularly in terms of, uh, of the JMC discussion. And, you know, to be fair, it's not been the major issue that we've, we've been pressing so far. The, the major issue so far have been the Article 50 letter and the negotiating process. Um, I think that leaving without paying a bill, you know, a bit like going out for dinner and leaving without paying a bill, uh, you know, in the end, somebody's going to catch up with you. And in these circumstances, you know, it is unlikely to say the least, that you would be able to move towards a constructive trade deal if you hadn't actually come to an agreement on the terms in which you were going to exit. You know, what would be the incentive for the other countries to do so? Okay, there might be some detriment, small detriment to them, 
but you know they would have to make a point about the, the refusal to pay the bill. There's also a requirement. You know, uh, the, the European budget is set until 2020, 2021. You, you know, there, there will be a gap in the European budget that needs to be filled. Um, any reasonable negotiation would have to come up with a sum that was due. Uh, the, I think the difficulty in this is that some sums were being banded about early on, whereas the right thing to have talked about was the methodology. How do you come to a calculation of this? And of course, that's where you know, the meeting between uh, the, the Taoiseach uh, uh, and the Danish and the uh, Dutch governments was significant in this regard. I think they have been struggling as a smaller group to see if they could suggest a, 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 a methodology which would drive this. And you know, it may well be that that is where the effort will now go in and is now going in to find the methodology. I think the, the, the problem that is viewed from Brussels with this is the influence, to be blunt, of the tabloid press and UKIP. And if there is a de build and development of a resentment of payment, that may create a huge political difficulty uh, for the UK government, whoever they are, uh, it, it, to, tr to negotiate this. Uh, you know, and some of the remarks from UKIP figures, and you know, UKIP thinking is sort of mainstream, as far as one can see in the Conservative Party at the moment, that it's a bit like a golf club, you know, you just say you're not going to pay your subscription. But actually, many golf clubs uh, require you to pay a subscription even if you resign for a period of time, and many golf clubs uh, forfeit, you forfeit your, uh, the deposit you have made if you walk out without due process. So you know, if it is like a golf club, even golf clubs have rules. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's the thing with it, because the figures do vary so, so wildly as to, as to what that could be. So I think how that will mm -hmm. be done will be one of the most important things. Um, on another point, in terms of free movement, um, how uh, the whole immigration setup might work, we were presented with a report a few weeks ago from Dr Eve Hepburn about options for differentiating the UK's immigration system. So I was just wondering, again, had there been any discussions on that? What are the feelings from the UK government in terms of that? And is that going to be a possibility for Scotland going forward? It, it, the issue of differentiated migration systems was dealt with in Scotland's place of, in Europe and, in my view, was a very positive uh, a, a compromise that we were offering. Such systems exist in Canada and in Australia. Uh, you know, I remember, I think I, this committee, or certainly at a previous committee, I quoted David Davis on the issue of what migration problems are. And migration problems are not in these circumstances borders. You know, if you're, nobody's proposing at this stage that the, this island should be in Schengen. So the borders issue is the issue about stopping people getting in. The, the, the migration is, issue being addressed is whether people have the right to stay. Now, you can deal with that differentially by you know, marking people's passport or marking people's papers or identity that you only have the right to stay in Scotland. So it's not a difficult thing to do. However, we should not underestimate the fact that we're dealing with a Prime Minister who used to be Home Secretary and has a particular, frankly, obsession with migration and is not prepared to countenance any weakening of that situation. So uh, at the moment, this is a dead duck. It's the right thing to do, and it would, in actual fact, have solved a problem for us and for the rest of the UK, uh, but a rational solution does not appear to be, to be possible. The issue of EU citizens is tied up in this too, and that, that is increasingly, well, it has been a big issue for the last 11 months, but considerable worry to me. I was, as you probably know, I was in Angus on um, Monday, um, and I visited one of the big uh, fruit companies, the um, Angus Soft Fruits, who'd given evidence before, of course, to the Parliament on some of these issues. And I had conversations with uh, people from Bulgaria, Romania, um, and I was really concerned for them because they are very distressed. And people are saying now what we thought would happen. Look, whatever the solution is to this, I'm really fed up with this and I really am doubtful whether I want to stay. You know, some people have bought flats, some people are here permanently, but they're looking at it and saying there are other places. Uh, guys spoke, one of the people I spoke to, who was a, had worked for there for a long time, quite senior, simply said, look, I have skills which you know, are needed in Germany, they're needed elsewhere, and although I'd like to be here, I just don't want to put up with this any longer. I don't want to, if I go back to Romania and I get on the plane, I don't know what's going to happen to me when I arrive in, in Scotland because you know, I'm nervous and fearful about this. And indeed, the Romanian Consul General was telling me there's been a bigger increase in the application for Romanian passports because people want something to prove 
who they are. Previously, you know, an identity card would have done. Now they need to prove who they are if they live here. So I'm very, very worried about that. And I was at Angus College meeting staff and students who um, are you know, very concerned and are not getting answers. And they've had 11 months of this. So we will see people who are really enormously positive contributors to Scotland and who are passionate about Scotland deciding in the end that it's not the place they want to be. And that will be damaging to our rep reputation across Europe and across the world. So this is a, a really concerning area. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I would agree with that. I recently met with a business, uh, a rural business, who had actually closed down part of their business already because it was heavily dependent on EU migrant labour and they, they decided it wasn't worth the uncertainty in the future. Um, so it is already having an impact. Um, there are again, some businesses, of course, right, that, that, that cannot do that. I mean, you know, if you look mm -hmm. at Angus South Fruit, there's a thousand uh, workers who come out of parts of the EU. It's simply not possible for that to happen. You know, the, the solution might be to move the entire business somewhere else in Europe mm -hmm. and do that. And the complexity of it is something I'm only, you know, I think a number of us are only just getting to grips with. Quite a number of people who may work in the soft fruits in the summer may work in the fish plants in the autumn and in the winter. So there is a sort of a, a number of industries that become dependent upon uh, this labour. Uh, and therefore there's a widespread effect both in businesses and more wide in the community and also those running the businesses. Somebody said to me, you know, who's involved in running one of these businesses, said, look, I'm very worried for the people who work for me, but I'm actually very worried for myself too because I may not have a job because I just can't keep this business going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I guess the supplementary question I'd had to that anyway was when we were presented with that report from uh, Dr Hepburn, uh, I mean, a lot of the other countries, the agreements that they have there, which you already highlighted, they were, we had them in detail in that report. And a lot of the arrangements, you know, could, were dependent on political will. And I was going to ask if you believe that political will is there, but uh, you've already answered that question. It's also, detend sorry, uh, sorry, it's also dependent on information. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of this could be, and could have been dealt with, not completely, but a lot of it could have been dealt with, with a flow of information and policy commitments. I mean, nobody knows what the policy of any prospective UK government, let alone this one, is about this matter going forward. So it's a lack of information. Where do people get the information they need to make life decisions? They don't have it. Oh, thank you. Um, another point I would like to touch on as well is in terms of the funding. I think we hear a lot about Horizon 2020 and cap payments with good reason. Um, but it's also in terms of relation to some of the other funds that uh, I would say local government in particular are heavily dependent on uh, and our local communities as well. Uh, for example, there's the Interreg Fund and you know, that transnational fund. Um, there's also LEADER, which is vital for our, our you know, rural areas too. Um, for the, in Angus it's worth 2.7 million, Aberdeenshire it's worth 2.8 million and they provide vital uh, projects in our local communities. So it was just, I mean I know that a lot still is unknown um, but really in terms of those kind of funds in particular, uh, are there any discussions on what the transitional uh, arrangements might be? No, uh, not with us. Uh, and that's concerning. I mean, you, you know, your experience in the East of Scotland network, you know how vital uh, these are. And these connections uh, are, these access to this money and the connections it produces are extremely vital. In my own area, you know, in the west of Scotland, uh, access to SRDP money, rural development money, access to agricultural support, uh, infrastructure funding, um, all those things are really important. Now, you know, Richard Lockhead will remember that when we moved from one SRDP programme to another, there was a hiatus. You know, it, with the best will in the world, even if you know what the future programme is, there's usually a bit in the middle which you know, doesn't, doesn't fit absolutely perfectly and there's a period of time where money isn't available. We're in a situation where we know where this programme will finish, the commitment is up until 2020, but we have no idea what comes in. Nor do we know the quantum that is being talked about. You know, will, for example, will there, would there be a sum of money which would be available on across a UK-wide basis to be allocated for these purposes? Will these purposes be priority purposes? Or will there be some other thing? Will that money be allocated to the Scottish Government by Barnett or in some other way? Absolutely no knowledge. Now, because of that, there will be a hiatus of some sort. I mean, how big it is, what it looks like, we don't know. An example I was using the other day is in my own constituency, the 
the island of Ling has been talking about a fixed link, a bridge, for many, many years. But they've moved on to the extent, I think, now they're beginning to wonder how that can be funded. Quite obviously, up until now, people will be saying, well, a European contribution will be needed. Now, I don't know whether there will be a contribution of equivalent monies, where that will come from. But until you know that, nobody can plan for it to happen. So there's just a hiatus in, in it. Now, that's a flow of information, but it's also we also require to know what the objectives would be from the UK government. If the UK government were to say to us, for example, look, uh, in the last five years, X amount has been allocated to Scotland through these programmes. So we're going to guarantee that X amount plus in inflation or whatever is going to be guaranteed to you for the same purposes. You now go ahead and set up those funds, you know, and you decide how it's distributed. That would be good. We would then say, right, let's go, let's go ahead. We, we don't want to leave Europe. We've got plans for other things. But yes, of course, we will go ahead and, and set those things up. But we're, I mean, we have no idea when that is going to happen or if that is going to happen. So we just can't say. We are saying to people, I had a conversation last week with um, SCVO. When I said, you know, who were talking about the allocation of funds to the third sector and said they had lots of ideas. I said, go away and, you know, work those ideas up and come back to me. And, you know, well, let's feed that through your, your, your cabinet secretary and let's see if we can develop some plan in the anticipation that we will need new structures. But what those are, you know, we don't know and the clock is ticking on them and it is, it is very concerning. Absolutely, thank you. And sorry, just one final point as well, uh, is just in terms of trade, and maybe briefly on security as well, because you touched on that answer uh, in one of your answers earlier. Um, and one of the briefings that, we, that we'd had here was about if no agreement is reached and using World Trade Organization rules as a, a fallback plan. Um, but before that we could we could begin trading on World Trade Organization rules, the UK would need to establish its new status within that organization, which requires agreement from all WTO members. So just for clarity, is that something that can happen uh, parallel to the discussion over the next couple of years, or does that have to wait until we are actually out of the EU, or what would happen? I'm not a scenario? trade expert, but I understand that you know, the difficulty would not be becoming a member of the WTO, we are in fact through the European membership a member anyway, the difficulty would be the application of the interim tariffs before you then negotiated the detailed tariffs, you would take the standard tariffs as set, some of those would be fine, some of those would be pretty disastrous. I mean there are huge agricultural tariffs you know, which would be uh, profoundly effective. I, I just don't think that's an option. Uh, you know, clearly the UK government thinks it might be an option but I think the, the difficulty would be great. The other issue in here is the process of trade. Uh, I've had conversations with a number of bodies, people like Chamber of uh, Shipping and people like that. And one of their concerns is, you know, the, the continuation of tariff-free access to the European market um, with the minimum regulation means that you, know, you, you can flow as you are now. The moment that flow is interrupted, it has consequences. One of them is, for example, for Scottish um, uh, shellfish, you know, which are delivered you know, promptly. And if they're not delivered promptly, they don't get delivered. Uh, but another one is just capacity. N no port now, you know, channel port or any sort, has huge capacity to stack up lorries that can be inspected or whatever. That's why you get these queues on, on motorways, you know, if you, have, um, if you have a dispute. Now, that would become commonplace because you simply wouldn't have the capacity to deal with it, let alone the workforce to deal with it. So those issues need to be resolved. Now, I can't imagine that, that on, the 20th, on the 30th of March 2019, that barrier is going to come down. But we need to know what the policy intention is of the UK and have some confidence they can achieve it. And that might bring us back to the approach of the Prime Minister. You know, confidence that you could achieve an ambitious policy intention is, to put it bluntly, not enhanced if you're standing in Downing Street denouncing the people you're about to negotiate with. I think that makes it harder. Yeah. Thank you. You had a question? Yeah, I've got two questions. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Firstly, just turning to the Secretary of State's letter to you, Minister, on the 29th of March. Uh, he says, David Davis, that Scotland's accession to EFTA and then the EEA would not be deliverable. So it's just really to ask you, are you aware of how he has come to that conclusion, who he's spoken to, uh, and, and what's your response to it? No, I'm, I'm not aware of who he's spoken to, no doubt. He's spoken to somebody. He does not speak on behalf of EFTA or the EEA, however. And, you know, we, our paper makes it clear that would be a, a new departure for EFTA and the EEA, but also that the negotiation is worth attempting. 
You know, we've been very, we were very clear in Scotland's place in Europe. You know, there's no certainties. But the right way to proceed with Scotland's place in Europe, in our view, was to place a, a requirement for a differentiated solution into the Article 50 letter, which was, would be the first step. Then to assist us in the discussions that we would have with EFTA and EEA using their good offices, one of the solutions, of course, would be to make use of their membership, uh, you know, in a, in a way not dissimilar to what the Greenland option was described as some time ago in terms of membership of the EU, but actually to piggyback on their membership. Um, so you know, we had figures involved and no knowledgeable EFTA and EEA who said it was a discussion that could and should take place, um, but it's not taken place because it was... This was submitted, we, we published this on the 20th of December. That letter is dated the 29th of March. Uh, I made a presentation based upon this at the January JMC. And then officials went away and, and discussed various parts of it. We were unaware, and, and then that process was, inverted commas, intensified after the JMC plenary at the end of January. I am not aware of any uh, inoperable barrier to any of this that arose during those official discussions. And it's not to say we came to agreement, but there was no, no deal breaker was dealt with during those discussions. And then I get the letter which simply says, no, can't be done. I don't believe that. Okay. Well, if ever deems the Scottish Parliament important enough to appear before, perhaps we'll get to ask them those questions ourselves, given that we're still struggling to get the, the Secretary of State to appear before this committee. What uh, I was also wanting to ask about relates to the UK government's usual response to the idea of Scotland having a bespoke arrangement mm -hmm. within Europe, which is no, what we need is a UK internal market. And that, again, has something that's, that's something that appears to come onto the agenda more and more in recent months is the idea of a UK internal market. And I wondered what you thought the agenda was there for the UK government and also how that could be compatible notwithstanding the fact that some of it may be necessary, how that could be compatible with devolution, given that the policies decided in this place here and regulations decided in this place here could be usurped by or have to be compatible with a UK internal market. Uh, the phrase they've used is a UK single market, uh, and you know, I've been very sceptical of that phrase. Um, there's a, before I come to just say what I think the motivation is, and I'll come to that in a minute, I might draw the committee's attention to a paper in the uh, Judicial Review, uh, paper by Burroughs and Fletcher called Brexit as Constitutional Shock and its Threat to the Devolution Settlement. Uh, and there's, it's a very interesting paper I would commend to people because what it deals with is this whole question of the way in which the devolution settlement is under threat and what that threat is. Uh, and it's a, an interesting academic study of what the problems are and, and, and how they might be addressed. Um, but I, I do think this concept of the UK single market has been overinflated by the Prime Minister for purposes of, of her own, really. Uh, first of all, it runs contrary to what devolution is about. Devolution is about subsidiarity. It's the appropriate places for power to be exercised. And then sharing those arrangements as we require to do so. Uh, and that's how we operate now. There is a differentiated constitution. There, of course, it has been since... The Act of Union in 1707, which is a differentiated act. So differentiated powers, those powers are appropriately exercised, they're exercised jointly as required. It's a bit of a threat to two things. One is the sovereigntist view of the UK Parliament, which is very much held by Brexiteers, that the UK Parliament is completely sovereign, must not be uh, dictated to or second-guessed by any other body. That's why you can't share power in Europe. That's why you can't accept the rights and influence the ECJ. That's why devolution is not very popular with these people, because it's seen as sharing power and, you, and, and, and compromising the UK Parliament. But there's also another very practical issue in here. And if you look at the issue of agriculture, it's particularly strong. One of the few ways in which the UK government would be able to set up new trade deals elsewhere would be to trade away agriculture, access to our agricultural and food markets. Now, they couldn't do that if those things were still controlled by devolved parliaments, because devolved parliaments would say no. Example you might use, I've heard the Welsh use the example of New Zealand lamb. You beef farmers might consider the issue of Brazilian beef. So they would not want to be in a position of not being able to secure those advantages in trade deals. 
So they have to control those things. Now, they are also, um, you know, I'm, I've seen it at close hand, the action at close hand, they're also very concerned about what happened over the CETA treaty uh, and in the Flemish parliament where, you know, for a period of time, a short period of time, it looks as if that might be scuppered by a devolved assembly. And they're determined not to, to see that not happen uh, here. So if they've got trade deals to do, if they've got things to trade off, like fishing, which will be traded off, you know, Mark, anybody's words, that's what they intend to do. They can only do that if they control those assets. And therefore, a major part of retaining devolved powers is about being able to do deals with things which presently are the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, the Northern Ireland Parliament. So uh, this is threatening to devolution, and it's threatening to the health of our agricultural industries. It's threatening to the health of rural Scotland. And we should be very realistic about this. This is, this is not simply about being inimical to devolution. It is about that. It is also about having the power to trade away things which we would not trade away and should not trade away, given that the interests of our farmers and our fishermen. Supplementary from Lewis MacDonald and Ross Greer. Thank you very much. Going back to your answers to Mary Evans on structural funding and in a way illustrated by your answer a moment ago to, to Richard Lockett, one of the challenges post-Brexit will be what is the relationship between uh, schemes that have a, an application across the whole of the UK and, and, and uh, particular interest here in Scotland. So, for example, structural funds at the moment are considered on a Europe-wide basis. They're dynamic, so the Highlands and Islands at one time had a different status from the status they have now, reflecting changes in economic and social development. Is the Scottish Government's proposal or preferred option on this to have a dynamic UK-wide scheme whereby we may be net beneficiaries or we may be net contributors, depending on our state of economic and social development relative to the rest of the UK? Or is it, as perhaps was implicit in one of your answers, uh, to freeze the situation as it is in 2020 uh, and make that the permanent, a permanent or a barnetised uh, financial relationship between the UK and Scotland? Well, no, our ambition is to be an independent country that is taking part in the European uh, funds. I mean, you know, that's, uh, I would be unashamed that you wouldn't expect me to say anything given, else. Given, given that, your yes. second preference. Well, then. no, it's not a second preference, but in, in terms of how we would operate within uh, you know, the present situation and within Brexit pending you know, in other constitutional settlement, my principle is no detriment. So, you know, the, the Scotland and particularly the Highlands and Islands, you know, I can declare an interest, I'm a Highlands and Islands MSP, my constituency has benefited disproportionately from European investment. That's right and proper, as it's proper, the Highlands should do so because, you know, they have, they have required special treatment. Um, and in those circumstances, we want to make sure there is no detriment. And the same principle of, of assisting areas to develop and assisting communities should apply. And also the priorities, for example, you know, in agricultural terms, one of the key issues of agricultural support in Scotland is keeping people on the land. Uh, you know, the whole, the whole crofting system is developed as a uniquely successful system of ensuring that communities are not completely decimated and that people are still on the land, the land is still in use, and that's a very useful system to have. If you have a UK-wide agricultural policy with virtually no variation, that won't be the principle. The principle will, quite rightly, you know, because the majority will win out in it, will be about agricultural production in areas where, you know, the east of England or the east of Scotland, and other and areas will lose out. So, no detriment. A policy that suits Scotland, for example, you know, I hear all the time from people in, in agricultural crofting and agricultural industries in my constituency that, above everything else, the retention of an LFAS, a, a less favoured area system, is absolutely crucial. Because without a less favoured area system, they will not be able to operate given they live in less favoured areas. So we pay attention to what the need is, to what the stakeholders are saying, to the principle of no detriment. And I suppose what I'm saying to Mr MacDonald is there's a matrix of issues, but based upon making sure that the interests of the people who elected us are, 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 are followed and that we are true to those. But, but does that imply that the principle of no detriment means you take a snapshot at the point of Brexit no, and no, keep it there no, forever no, more? No, it, it doesn't have to be the existing system, clearly. Uh, th if those existing systems work and work well, they should be retained. If they don't, they can be changed. But, you know, the preference is, and I just want to say this, probably is my last answer, the preference is 
uh, to continue uh, or to find a way to be a member of the EU and taking part in these schemes which have been very positive for Scotland. I was at the Europe Day celebrations in, in Edinburgh on uh, Tuesday uh, in Castle Street uh, and they were vibrant and, and interesting and, and vital but the people who were there and there were representatives of all the 27 and a lot of people from Edinburgh and the surrounding area but the people who were there, they, they were saying what we want is to celebrate something which you know, has produced peace and prosperity on our continent for all of our lives. And that's vitally important to us. And we shouldn't forget that. It's about peace and prosperity. Thank you. Do you have time for yeah. one more supplementary from Ross Greer? Of course. Thanks. Uh, just very briefly, Minister, it was in relation to the, the final answer you gave to Mary Evans. It'd be interesting to hear uh, from yourself. You've mentioned the uh, amount of time you spent in the rest of Europe recently meeting with uh, other parliamentarians and other governments. Um, there is a perception, or there are two different perceptions about the relative strength of the UK's negotiating position. Um, and Lewis MacDonald might like to, to feed in on this, but we recently met with a delegation from another European parliament who were perplexed by what they'd heard when they were at the House of Commons, the belief about the, the strength in the UK's position on the basis of the cars that we sell to Germany, for example. What have you picked up from the rest of Europe? What do they believe the strength of the UK's position to be in comparison to the perception they have of the UK's own self-belief, the UK government's self-belief? Everybody wants to resolve this in as positive a way as possible. You know, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, that's, that would be in everybody's interest, to resolve it as positive as possible. It cannot be as good as what exists now, uh, and, and that's the issue. The language of the Article 50 letter from the Prime Minister implies that in some way there is another arrangement that is just as good, and that that will be come to because they are owed this. That's not the view. The view is this is a mistake. Uh, it's a profound mistake. It shouldn't be happening. But if it is happening, then let's get it done as well and as neatly and as carefully as possible. But it won't be the same. And the advantages of membership are not available to non-members. That is simply axiomatic. And the language being used you know, is either that language of saying, you know, that we'll have a strong, constructive relationship and there'll be some wonderful pot of gold or many pots of gold that will come to us because we're outside the EU, which is nonsense. Uh, and then the, the contrast then is in language that says, and stop interfering in our election because you know, we know best and we, we know what we're doing. It's all just a bit confusing. And sometimes you know, I have heard it, I was heard it said by a very distinguished former European figure some weeks ago, you know, in the end, they go. That's it. You know? And it's a mistake and it shouldn't have happened, but it's happened. Now let's move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been very generous with your time, Minister. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today. And we'll now have a brief suspension. And go into private. And go into private session.